Hello everyone, today is Friday, July 16th, 2021. My name is Evan. Welcome back to our weekly stock market analysis video. If you're brand new to these videos, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Here's how they work. We break up our analysis into two parts. In part one, we look at everything that went on this week in markets. That's things like market internals, sector performance, correlations, volatility, credit markets, interest rates, all of the good stuff and pick apart everything that stands out and looks interesting. And then in part two, we jump into the charts. We look at those longer term trends. We take the data from part one, make sense of it and try and best position ourselves looking ahead. It's a bit of a more macro sort of take on financial markets, not just a myopic sort of price on stocks specifically. So hopefully that sounds good to you. Let's jump into some of the headlines from this week. And it was a busy week out there. The story of really the past five days here is one, all of the major averages were in red this week, were in decline, which is kind of the first time we've seen that in a while. Typically, we have one sort of saving grace, which recently has been the NASDAQ that has been remaining green and still kind of keeping this market alive. But really, it's the second point here of a tale of five stocks versus 5,000 stocks. And what I mean by that is this notion of the names that we all have grown to, to love in helping lead this market higher over the past, you know, call it six years, seven years, this bull market, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, these are the types of names that have grown to a trillion plus in market cap. And when we have market cap weighted indices like the S&P 500, like the NASDAQ 100, that include these stocks, we naturally have a situation where if those five stocks are doing well, if they're getting flows, inflows into their um, into their stocks, then it is very hard for the S&P and for the NASDAQ to do poorly. It doesn't really almost matter what the remaining other, you know, 5,000 stocks are doing. Obviously, S&P only contains 500 and NASDAQ only 100 stocks, but I think you see the point here. And this week really sort of accelerated that differential between what small caps have been doing and what mega caps have been doing. And we're going to talk more about that in this video. Last but not least, we have earnings season about to heat up. Not really a comment on this week, but something that is to come. So let's jump in here with some numbers. First and foremost, if we look at the right hand column here, this is the one week change number. So basically how indices did this week. And you can see right across the board, the Dow Jones did the best only down a half a percent, S&P down about a percent, NASDAQ down about a percent. But of course, here is where we're seeing the drastic underperformance again is 5% down for the Russell. That's a big differential. And this is not the first week. So we basically have seen this occur now for the past last week and then started to even the week before that see this spread start to emerge between the Russell and everything else. If we look at world stocks minus the United States, they were also down 1.27%. Let's take a look at market internals. This is a hot topic this week. Everyone is posting about market internals, market breadth, advanced decline line, seeing charts flown around everywhere and everyone's an expert. And let's sort of, let's sort of break it down here on what, you know, what matters and, and how we can sort of look at this. So the first row here are, are, are stocks hitting 52 week highs minus lows. NYSE 52 week highs minus lows. And you can see that that number this week, right? Despite the fact that we had weakening breath and we have leadership that is narrowing, we still saw 500 stocks making 52 week highs on the week. That to me is still constructive. That is positive that this number is still in triple digits and posting these time these types of levels. Obviously, you can see as the week went on, we started to slow down in the number of stocks hitting 52 week highs. So the, you know, sort of the the growth rate there is slowing, but overall, we are still seeing 500 more stocks over the course of this week make new highs rather than new lows. If we look at the second row, this is where things become more concerning and this is where everyone is sort of throwing up their arms and looking at is the cumulative AD line, which just measure, measures each and every single day 
how many stocks went up on the day, how many stocks went down on the day, and sum that up and post the number. And you can see basically Monday we had 500 net stocks rising, but every single day after that, we saw a net negative decline of stocks for a grand total of minus 3,563. Another way to measure individual stock performance is this last row, percentage of stocks over 20 SMA. And you can see that this is shrinking as well. And so these are all different measures of market internals or market breadth. If we go to this chart here, as you know, this is one of my favorites to look at. This is pretty much what I always am kind of hanging my hat on is looking at market internal strength is this cumulative chart of the 52 week highs minus lows. And I'm always watching the trend and slope here. And right now the trend is in fact still up and to the right, even though it is getting more gradual. So it is weakening a little bit in its in its power and its strength and its in its acceleration. So it is notable, but the trend is still up. Now I don't have a chart right now. I didn't bring a chart to post the AD line cumulative sense, but it is definitely flat to declining or diverging to what the major markets are doing. And, you know, I saw this question come through. Actually, I get this question a few times this week on, you know, what's the significance and, you know, what's more important. And like everything in markets, everything is, is, is useful at the right times and, you know, in the right sort of lens or, or, or toolbox, right? So, I like the 52 week highs minus lows because it is a more intermediate term. It's a longer term gauge of market health. It's not so sensitive to the little movements on a day to day, week to week basis. So this to me is the more important driving force if I'm looking out one to two to three plus months. And what we'll start to see though, is when we look back at these numbers, 3000 stocks net declining on the week, they haven't quite started to push to new 52 week lows yet. So what you can imagine is this second row here is, is just an earlier sort of view of this, right? So if those stocks continue to decline, if we see another 3000 next week, then I would probably, you know, uh, bet that this is going to start to decline because we're going to start to get more of those stocks declining, making 52 week lows and then starting to influence this chart. So the way I like to think about it here, and I know we're going a little long in the tooth, but this is an important topic because I saw so many comments come through on breath this week is this to me is just a longer term study of, of, of market internals. And it's been more reliable in the testing that I've done. It does not mean that I think that this is irrelevant or not useful. I think this is, can have plenty of application and I still absolutely look at the AD line, but I'm not necessarily uh, super interested in trying to catch two, three, four, five day moves. I'm looking at more the broader stroke, which is why I like looking at the 52 week highs minus lows. So to sum this up, I think we definitely have, as we've been talking about with small cap underperformance for the past weeks now, I think that is a concern that we have a lack of leadership, that we have a, a very narrow group of stocks pushing us higher. However, and when I look at this, I am still, you know, kind of looking at this saying, OK, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt still to the buyers because we've seen this before. As soon as this slope starts to go gradual, rotation occurs. Maybe, you know, we start to see other sectors pick back up. We start to see outflows out of maybe bonds or something else. And, you know, here we go again to the next leg higher. So that's the way I'm thinking about it. Glass, you know, semi full, um, maybe not even half full, but still pretty constructive, I think, overall, but there are absolutely cross currents. And we're going to talk more about that when we get into part two of this video. So let's kind of speed things up here because it's going to be a long video. Now, sector performance, you can see almost everything, or I shouldn't say almost everything. We had three sectors that were still, that were brightly in the green here, and they were our leaders, utilities, staples, real estate. Utilities and staples aren't necessarily the top two that you want to see on there. If you're looking for risk appetite and good, healthy stock market return, Turns. So that is concerning, but those were the leaders. On the downside, energy really taking it on the chin this week, almost down 8%. Consumer discretionary down 2.5%, materials down 2.25%. If we take a look at correlations, I was actually surprised to see a lot of the correlations sort of break down here. 
and uh, loosen up a little bit. Now we're only looking at 10 day correlations, but still I was, I was expecting, you know, generally when you start to see, um, you know, kind of more fear in the market, things tend to get more correlated and quite get that this week, or at least I'm not seeing that in these numbers. And the one th sort of thing I want to highlight on is this TNX here. So this is the 10 year yield. Take a look at its correlation to the Russell 2000. So it's a 0 0.73, 0 0.72 correlation, just pretty high. And what that's basically saying is interest rates, what the 10 year yield is doing is, you know, very much moving in pretty good lockstep with what the Russell 2000 is doing. And so if yields are going down, Russell's going down. And we've talked about this relationship with yields and the NASDAQ quite uh, often in the past videos, it was usually, it's usually been pretty strongly inverse correlated, but notice the, you know, positive correlation here with Russell. And I think that makes sense mostly from, you know, a lot of the other conversations we've had about correlations in the past. If we take a look at volatility here this week, it climbed on the week back up towards the upper teens. We went out at around 18 spot two, two, three month VIX up around 22. The curve, the shape is pretty much the same as last week. We've just elevated up across uh, all of the expirations. And that sort of makes sense. We saw uh, markets down, more fear coming in the market. So pretty much, um, you know, makes sense with, with what we would expect. In terms of interest rates, we saw yields down across the board. So that means in, uh, bond prices were rallying. We see investment grade bonds up. We saw high yield bonds decline, still nothing too, uh, you know, out of the ordinary on either of those. If we take a look at dollar and commodities, dollar index continuing to climb this week, 0.65%. That's some pretty good ground that it's made. It's back to positive on the one month. Gold was still positive though, but silver saw a little bit of a breakdown. We're gonna talk about silver later on in this video. Bitcoin down 6%, still hanging above 30,000. Ag was up, crude oil down, natural gas, holding pretty resilient down just slightly. So on the week, if we look at the report card, and once again, I think this will be a surprise to many, but market breadth here, I'm still giving that a check mark, given what we're seeing there out of this, out of the 52 week high list. So that's the check mark, nothing else gets a check mark. So we got a solid D here in terms of performance. If we take a look at trading systems, so these are basically how I am investing. This is where my allocation and money is. So our Merlin trading system, which is a longer term, I like to think medium term trading system, is still very much interested in this market. It's not sh shying away. It's picking up more stocks on these dips. It's getting stopped out of some positions, but it is really basically just going right back to the well and accumulating more stock when it sells anything. So it is still very much invested in this market across 40 positions. Our shorter term tactical system though, you can see is net short right now. It's only got one position on, but it's net short. I haven't looked at what the orders are for Monday, but this is certainly more in line with what, you know, some of the short term behavior that you're seeing out there and the more uncertainty and uh, maybe anxiety out of that market. So if you wanna learn more about these trading systems, if you wanna get signals to your email, to your phone, on on these trading systems, click that link appearing in the top right of your screen. We'll be back in just a moment here with part two. All right, we're back. We've got TC2000 open. We've got our equity market grid that we're showing here. So S&P in the top left, NASDAQ top right, Russell bottom left, Acquiex in the bottom right. We have a custom smart trend filter indicator applied here. So this measures price and volume, helps us determine trend, trend strength, path of least resistance. And that is the multicolored dots you see on the screen. And price itself is the white dashed lines. So if we look here at the weekly time frame, we didn't really see any change here despite the decline across all of the equity markets. You can see the S&P 500 still has a green check mark here for bull trend on the long-term time frame and path of least resistance higher. Same thing for the NASDAQ. You can see here still printing a nice green dot there. The Russell 2000, notice what's happening here though, is we are starting to see price break below our trend filter. Notice it has not turned red yet. So it is still in this neutral state. And one of the, you know, kind of benefits or features of the smart trend filter is that it attempts to sort of reduce whipsaw and help with the transition. So it's not a, you know, it's not like a, um, 
a, a simple moving average where you know you're just selling below it and and you know getting whipsawed up and down as price goes down and below it and so on and so forth this tries to kind of smooth out that transition so that is in danger of turning down basically next week but we'll need to see if that actually happens still a yellow dot there same thing for acquiex now what i like to do though is you know i like to say okay i like to use these trend filters in a multiple time frame sort of situation so what i'll do is if this is now yellow i will go down to a daily chart on the russell and then i will say okay this is yellow, but on the daily chart, I got a sell signal back on the 14th. And in fact, I got a sell signal here back on the 8th. So maybe this is your confirmation. This is your signal to maybe get short, but you're using this as your overall time to, you know, essentially time it, your overall direction. And I don't want to get tied up into strategy. Obviously, there's lots of different ways and there's a lot more info on our website on this indicator. So um, check that out. But I guess if we just continue to look here at the Russell and we look at the daily chart, you can see it is in a sell signal and it's basically been in a sell signal since Wednesday of this week. But technically last Friday, last Thursday, it had a sell signal as well. So the Russell's in a tough spot here. It's moving back to the bottom end of its range. We'll look at that in just a second. Take a look in the top left though, S&P still bullish. Uh, even on the daily chart, you can see it's above trend. Same thing with the NASDAQ, still above trend. Not the same for the bottom right here, Acquia which has been in a very tough situation really since the middle of June when it produced its first sell signal and it's been, you know, sell to neutral over the past four weeks. So let's take a look here at some candlestick analysis. Let's get a little bit tighter on our analysis and kind of frame things up a little bit. I think that's the one. Let's see. Uh, we've been using a few different grids here. So Let's stick with this one. So S&P 500, here's the way I'm kind of looking at this. Last week, we had this strong pivot right in here. As markets sold off, we touched under 4,300, and then that acted as a springboard to new highs. Well, basically what happened this week, and I covered this a little bit on Thursday's trade idea videos, let me switch over to this one, is we traded to new highs for these tight three days here. We just went sideways. This was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week. And we just went sideways up here and kind of, you know, tested the commitment to kind of buyers and sellers. Ultimately, we started to break down on Thursday. We recovered a little bit and then we came on a second kind of selling day here into the week. So into the weekend. So what I'm looking at now is this loss of short term kind of price level, which was these new highs right in here. So this was the level I would have liked to see it hold above to keep this, you know, as bullish and as healthy and as, mo as much momentum to the upside as we could possibly expect above this level here, which was, you know, let's call it 4360. And we closed essentially right at it on Thursday. So Thursday gave us this nice little decision to see how we would finish out the week. And then of course we saw how we finished out the week with more selling. So in the very short term, if you're a short term trader, I'd be watching sort of this area here as a point of inflection. And if we're sitting below here, then I think the risk to last week's lows around, you know, 4290 or so opens back up. And I wouldn't be surprised if we kind of come back down here and test this next week, maybe carve out some type of range in between, you know, 4290 and up around 4390. Nice hundred point range here in the S&P, about 2%, two and a half percent. And that could be a little bit of a chop box there while we digest earnings. That's a very reasonable sort of path or, or scenario I could see this market taking. Now, if we start breaking below 4,300 and we start looking at some of these longer term levels that I don't think I have really articulated on here. So let's just use this one. But if we start coming back below 4,300 and we really start seeing this sell off pick up, then you know we have the old highs here around 4,200, 4,250 or so right in this zone. This is where the S&P went sideways for about three months and broke out from in early to mid June. So if we look here maybe at say this weekly chart, if we start you know, really seeing the sell off pick up, then this 4250, 4260 area is definitely where I want to see this 
this market defended. I mean, you could put some um, some nice old long-term channels in here of where the S&P 500 has been trading in for the past you know, year or so, you could draw this nice little channel here and say that, you know, right again, right around 4250 or so is an important zone. And so that's where we'd want to pay attention to. I don't know that we get down there, but if we do start to see more of a tree shake and some more volatility and uncertainty, then that's where my mind would start to gravitate to. So that's kind of the the, the roadmap there on the S&P 500. We're a bit in pullback mode now. I wouldn't be surprised to see that continue to be tested longer term like we talked about on the first part of this video i still like the overall structure of this market now if we see another week like this week if we see more violent price action next week then my opinion starts to change but until and if that happens i would still be cautiously optimistic here on an intermediate term basis and just be watching the individual stocks that are selling off seeing if i can get some good prices if i look at the nasdaq 100 you can see we kind of have a similar thing going on here we have this 36281 that's the kind of upper bound here where i would have wanted to see that hold above that was essentially the new highs we broke out from we're back below it we saw it was some heavy volume sell off and now we are you know looking like we want to come and test last week's lows again i did want to make a comment here about the s p 500 so again to illustrate and to speak on breath a little bit more again. So this is the market cap weighted S&P 500, but if we were to throw it to the RSP, this is an equal weight S&P 500 index. So same 500 stocks, the difference is, is we're not giving, you know, 10% weight to Apple and, and you know, 9% to Microsoft. We're giving everybody an equal vote. And in that situation, in that scenario, you can see what the S&P 500 looks like. We never got a breakout here, and we are still very much range bound for the past three or four months. Again, take that in comparison to SPY, which looks a little bit different. So that's another way to illustrate breadth is just looking at sort of equal weight indices. You can find a lot of them for most of uh, any of the big indexes too. Um, what else do I want to talk about? VIX? Oh no, IWM. We didn't even touch IWM. So IWM here, this is obviously the big story of this week because this was down 5%, third week in a row now negative, fourth out of the past fifth weeks that are negative, and we are coming back down towards these lows in here. So this is, you know, still arguably range bound. If you're a longer term trader or an investor, position trader, then you know you might be looking at this on a weekly time frame and saying like look this had a you know epic move from the covid lows and we moved 138 percent in about 10 months which is pretty historic and now we're just going sideways for five months and we're trading just off of highs so again time frame matters perspective matters here but you know the more we start hammering against this low 200 zone the more likely it is to eventually break i don't know that it breaks this time i think i'd be pretty interested you know, in this area down here as potentially being a buyer. I was watching price pretty closely on this day. I was looking for price to get down a little bit further to be a buyer, but I missed my entry. And when I kind of saw that this bounce didn't last all that long, when this session came and then this session came, then it was kind of clear to me that, you know, something wasn't right here or we probably had a little more probing lower to do and you know kind of here we are back down around 215 so I don't have a position kind of just scoping this out I am interested in watching this in the 210s down here if we get there next week and I think there's a pretty decent shot at doing that so that is kind of the, the the summary on just the general market if we actually look at VIX one other you know again slightly concerning thing that I'm looking at is we talked about one of the things we've been talking about are these VIX pops that keep getting uh, lower highs here and they keep fading from just lower levels and the one thing that you'll notice though is every time it pops you know you'd like to see it just kind of you know you'd like to see it deflate and kind of stay down for a period of time they seem to have been staying down you know for a shorter amount of time in between the fact that this was up around 20 just you know five days ago and now here we are going right back up again this again is slightly concerning we would have wanted to see this stay down so i'm paying attention to this i'm watching the vix next week and um you know again 
another thing that I'll be paying attention to if it starts getting back over 20 or feels comfortable holding above 19 or so, then that might be a bit of a concern as well. So that is kind of all I had to say on the major markets. The only other anecdotal thing I'll say is sentiment seemed to shift pretty quick. And I think there, you know, surprisingly, is just a lot of bears uh, right now and, and maybe deservingly so. Maybe I'm being too optimistic here or not worried enough, but there does seem to be a pretty uh, quick sentiment shift that has occurred this week. So be very interesting to see how this plays out. And of course, with earnings season uh, that we are all kind of looking at, we talked a lot about, uh, so we talked about fix, we talked about RSP, silver is the only other thing I wanted to mention here on the major. So you can see silver starting to break this range that it's been in. So let's pay attention to this as it closed at new lows going into the weekend, heavy volume. This looks a little bit tough here if it uh, continues to move lower and never filled this gap. So other than that, let's take a look at our industries and sectors of interest. There are few on the upside. There are lots on the downside and this video has gone pretty long. So I'm not gonna go into all the, the short ones, but on the upside, it was basically dominated by utilities. You can see, let's go to weekly chart here. You can see utilities here, regulated electric breaking out. You can see XLU breaking out, which we have a position in. Um, so we uh, own this. We actually own this through a 3X ETF. And uh, surprisingly, there is actually a 3X ETF for, for utilities. Uh, waste management. Uh, confectioners and utilities again. So again, all defensive sectors, industries that are working higher this week. If we look on the downside here and let's just look at maybe sectors just to get a roundabout look at what worked and what didn't. You can see a lot of industrials in the downside and a lot of cyclicals in the downside and some basic, materi basic materials like agriculture, chemicals, copper, gold, lumber, uh, then we move into cyclicals like advertising, apparel, auto parts, department stores, gambling, luxury goods, recreational vehicles. These are all things that were underperforming or extremely heavy this week. Residential construction, manufacturing, beverages, education. This thing has not been able to just let up. This is in a very impressive chart here on how much pain this has inflicted over the past year. Uh, food and food distribution, tobacco, energy, 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 energy. So a lot in that space and financials, so on and so forth. So lots on the downside this week as expected, but you can see the lists here on my screen. So you can feel free to go through those. I'll expand that so everybody can see it and maybe go through those on their own time, take a screenshot, do a little homework over the weekend, see if you can find some good stocks. If you're you know, looking to short or maybe you're looking for opportunities to um, you know, play some bounces in those areas too. So that's it. That is the roundup for this week. Long video, but lots to discuss. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you're looking at. Where, where do you come down on the whole breath debate? Is this something that's got you concerned? What are you looking at this week? I'd love to hear it below. And as always, I want to thank you for tuning in and watching. Every Friday, we do our long form videos just like this. So be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give it a thumbs up if you like the video. And you can always catch it on thetraderisk.com as well. Have a great weekend and we'll see you back here next week. Oh,